long and prosperous. I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Lilo Dallas Multipass. Shut up and take my money. By Grabthar's hammer. <laughs> what a saving. One does not simply walk into Mordor. X never, ever marks the spot. Until he's coming. You're a wizard, Harry. Stay a while and listen. Hey, old Kermit. Frog here. Your ties are cool. So say we all. This is a play on nerds. Welcome, welcome, ladies, gentlemen, boys, and girls of all ages to a play on nerds episode 205. I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman. And we're here to co host the hell out of this. Oh, yeah. And uh, this week, in honor of the much anticipated Agatha All Along, featuring everyone's favorite breakout character, Agatha Harkness. We take a look at another Marvel film pulled out of ages past, filled with magic and weird, twisted realities. That's right. We're talking about Doctor Strange. No, not that Doctor Strange. The 1978 made-for-TV movie Doctor Strange, starring Peter Hooten and Jessica Walter. Good old Peter Hooten. Everyone loves him. Peter Hooten. <laughs> I dare you to find a more fun name to say. <laughs> He couldn't say it in a fun way, but we'll talk about that later. (laughs) That's right. Before we get to that, Jarman, what have you been up to since last time we talked? You have had quite an adventure from what I understand. A little bit. Uh, We took a a couple weeks off or one week off because we uh, I went to Dragon Con and uh, been there in the past. If you're a long long time listener to the podcast, I've done interviews there before and stuff when I had. Oh, yeah. That's from way back. Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> way back but i hadn't been in like six years or something because wow. just money and covid like it was just not a good idea to go to a giant yeah. convention and then i was catching up on my career and got married and so now it's my first convention going with uh my my wife and the first time she's ever gone and she had a blast i oh, she was worried that she would have too much you know anxiety about the people and stuff but she had a great time she's really oh, into good. fallout and final fantasy 14 and um zelda and there's a lot a lot of panels and stuff about that stuff there in cosplay so she was really familiar with and it was nice going back much older now because i'm not there to like just get drunk and try to meet girls so it was a different experience <laughs> that's right you got to see all the other idiots doing that yeah and thankfully at dragon con i hope you get to go one year steve that's it's like it. there's people of all ages there. there's panels and events for people of all ages too so you can have an entirely different convention as somebody else who's going. So I actually went to right. a lot more panels this time and admired the costumes and like went to bed at a reasonable hour and you could get up yeah. early, <laughs> take the kids to the parade. If you want to, there's a parade on Saturday morning for everybody, the whole family, a lot of family Ooh. events. Um, so it was just, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I got to see the Star Trek um, Strange New Worlds cast uh, on a panel. Very cool. I got to see uh, what we do in the shadows. Some of the cast was there from that. That was a really fun Ooh. panel. Saw some paranormal panels with people coming in talking about paranormal stuff and things like that. Ugh. The cool thing was the Fraggle Rock crew was there. Um, yeah, you mentioned. I, I w- wasn't able to get to see them, unfortunately. They were in the parade as the, the um, I forget what they call the person who's like the head of the parade. The um, I like the par- parade master? That doesn't sound quite It's something right. like that. But the, the, they were like the featured guests of the parade. So they're at the front. Okay, very cool. And then one of them or two of them were actually... Uh, at the late night puppet slam on Sunday night. Um, so I did get to see two of that, the performers, but they're the new performers, the new reboot. Um, the okay. one who plays Red and the one who plays Gobo were um, in the show doing like diff- a different, uh, their own puppets. They had like their own little act they did. And when the guy came on stage, I didn't recognize the name, but uh, Jolie went crazy because she's in the Broadway stuff. And he was in the original cast of Avenue Q and stuff like that as well. Oh, all right. So he's a big puppet performer. Um, and that whole puppet show was amazing. Uh, Mark Meir, who does the voice of Commander Shepard in Mass Effect, he had his own puppet show that he did at the Late Night Puppet Slam, where he had little <laughs> little puppets playing um, Darth Vader and the HR consultant for the Empire talking to Darth Vader, and it was adorable. So, uh, yeah, it was just a good time all around. Um, once I get my bearings again and go in the future, maybe I'll be able to do more interviews and stuff for the podcast, because it's a lot of fun guests that are there. But at this point, just go and have fun, you know? Yeah, exactly. So... Yeah, that was that was my time. Lot it took like four or five days there, but Steve, what have you been up to since last time? Well, since last time we talked, uh, I went and saw Alien Romulus. Mm-hmm. How was it? Uh, real good. Th- the third best Alien movie. That's pretty good. Pretty damn good. Hmm. 
And the first ones are Alien and Aliens, and really the order is based on your preference, but those are still two of right. the, the, the two best. Um, and then Anna had her sinus surgery, which went really well, but I got to be on pretty hardcore kid duty and Anna duty for a couple of days. That was fun. Of course. And then uh, we are getting ready because tomorrow... We're going to celebrate my daughter Joyce's eighth birthday. Oh, that's and wonderful. she is having her first ever sleepover birthday party. Hey, we remember those. So we got <laughs> we got cots and we have an inflatable mattress. And I figure out how I'm going to play them a movie on my like computer display that doesn't have speakers. It's been a fun adventure. <laughs> Gosh, at least that means uh, she has friends. That's good. Because I always worry that if I have kids someday, they'll have no one to invite over for a birthday party. So if anything, <laughs> we're the limiting factor. We always tell them, like, pick three friends. Mm. So not everyone's going to get to come. It is not that kind of thing. <laughs> so some kids are going to get their butt hurt, and that's okay. Yep. Um, and this time, like, she chose Lucy, her cousin, Christian's kid. Nice. As one of them, and as a case, so you get to pick two more friends. And so there was one friend that I'm very surprised she didn't invite, but I was like, that's it. So things change. Pick three. <laughs> Dad's not messing around. <laughs> she gets it. She does. Uh, so we're excited for that. It's going to be movies and popcorn and the painting of nails. Oh, that's cute. And uh, she's turning eight. So that's so exciting. Man, that's why my parents got divorced. <laughs> so you're doing okay. Uh, I just, I mean, maybe not just better than your parents. Yeah. <laughs> hey, a lot of kids. Let me just, smart let me just double check. Am I a 64 year old grifter? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. okay you're good. You're good. Already, already doing better. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I think he was, was he 47 or old? something at that time, but it's okay. <laughs> when you were eight, he was 47. Oh, no. no. Maybe a little older. Maybe like when 50s. I met you at 10, he was he was pretty stinking old. He always looked old 10. because he had gray hair since he was like 12. But, you know, but all I remember is the first time you told me your dad's age, it shocked me. So 1994 and he was born in I was eight and he was born in 1939. So that's 40, 54, 55 years old. Yeah, he's 55 years old when he got a divorce. Okay. From mom. <laughs> so you met there him at 57. <laughs> 57. Yeah, 57 turned 58 somewhere. In there, there you go. <laughs> that makes more sense. Personal stories can be found on Sappy Crap Podcast. If you go check that yeah, out, we've recorded local. 41 of those bastards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no one listened to any of them. But if you want to hear our whole history of our whole damn lives, you can find it. There. Some of them have no views on YouTube. <laughs> Legitimately <laughs> zero views. <laughs> they got downloads, though. They, they just when no I'm views feeling on YouTube. good about myself, I go and I look. Our YouTube is only to bring me, up just to bring me recently. down. <laughs> um, but yeah. But I think that takes us to some nerdy news. It's time for nerdy news. All right. So my fun name for our new story today is Cuban brain sandwich. I do love Cuban sandwiches, but not brain sandwiches. So uh, <laughs> this is over from Paul Seaburn at Mysterious Universe, one of my favorite sites of weird and strange stories. But this is actually a true story, not like a paranormal thing. Uh, back from 2016 to 2021, there were several diplomats and CIA officials and other government employees. Whenever they would go to, to Cuba for some kind of event for a diplomatic summit or conferences, a lot of people were getting these weird debilitating brain injuries and mental health issues. And when they'd all be in the same room and a bunch of them would complain about it and go to the doctor, it was very strange. And the symptoms were so similar between them that it started getting its own name called the Havana syndrome. And they couldn't figure out what, this. Yeah, it was I in the news. We talked about this like. Eight years ago or something. It was 2016. Yeah, when it, when it first started happening. Yeah. Um, but just recently, CNN just reported that the National Health Institute has stopped research into it because they found out with an internal investigation that a lot of subjects who were, who were diagnosed with these things were yeah. coerced into participating in the studies um, and that the CIA made them join research before they would allow them to get health care for it. So, like, they couldn't just see a regular doctor and get it covered in their insurance unless the CIA first examined them and did, like, a thorough research on them with their doctors and their research. Um, and even weirder, the NIH officially stated officially stated that they found no evidence of brain injuries in these um, patients. But when they did independent studies outside of the NIH and the government officials, they said there's definitely brain injuries that are found, and there's evidence of some kind of electromagnetic weapon that might have been used on these people. 
And so it's kind of like, are they covering something up? Are they just inept or like, what the hell's going on? Because it sounds like it could have been an experimentation of some kind of weird brain weapon, which wouldn't be that far fetched if you use electromagnetic waves to screw people's brains. I mean, that's yeah, some, we could do that. Probably <laughs> it's all electrical signals up there that could screw with that. Yeah. So it's just a really strange Cuban brain sandwich story that I'm like, uh, there's bad things happening out there. I'm glad we don't have it happening to us because who knows? Just don't go to Cuba. <laughs> yeah i'm all right i don't like i'm not into the heat so i don't think i'm really gonna go to cuba i don't need to see the old cars and you know communism but <laughs> <laughs> uh, communism but that takes uh, us to our main segment i believe dr strange that's... 1978 <laughs> Right. What a doozy, folks. So strap in. Uh, we went, we open on some red text explaining that there is a realm beyond our world. And in the beyond, there's battles pr- to protect our world from the terrible things there. We meet Morgan Le Fay, a sorceress from this other world who is addressed by a giant red rubber chicken with four <laughs> eyes which tells her that there's a sorcerer on earth that's getting old and so he's going to be gone and this time has finally come to conquer earth and it feels a lot like the power rangers <laughs> uh, she has three days to strike him down to stop the succession so that they can finally conquer the planet in our reality Uh, We then cut to a darkened house where Wong, uh, a a nicely dressed Asian gentleman in a suit, is looking for his master, the aging sorcerer that was foretold. Uh, Wong is warned that Morgan's uh, warned that like Morgan is coming. I keep wanting to calling her Morgana because of like yeah, like our stuff. I I keep having to stop myself. Morgan's presence and is warned that the barriers are crumbling. We then meet Stephen Strange, a misogynistic ladies' man and resident doctor psychologist psychiatrist. I couldn't, I don't remember which one it was. (laughs) Morgan takes a yellow cab through Midtown. That just happens, uh, where she is harassed by some hoodlums, and she scares them away with magic mean eyes. <laughs> uh, Morgan, she watches a woman intently, seeming to like try to possess her almost, but then she senses that the sorcerer is nearby. Morgan disappears, and the possessed woman pushes the sorcerer off a bridge. <laughs> um, the sorcerer is somehow able to walk away from this. Uh, meanwhile, the tormented woman sits and like thinks she just killed a man. Doctor Strange has a dream of this traumatized woman being traumatized. Uh, and I literally wrote, and nothing happens in this movie for 10 goddamn minutes. <laughs> I literally wrote it. Uh, Morgan stalks the traumatized woman who wanders into traffic in her dismay and then ends up at the hospital where Dr. Strange is stationed. But the doctor is on the case. And then really there is five more minutes where nothing happens in this yep. full five minutes. I kid you not. Uh, the woman is submitted to the psych ward while Morgan draws ever closer. And then another five minutes <laughs> of just nothing happening. Just nothing. Uh, finally, the sorcerer shows up to move the plot along <laughs> and inquires with Dr. Strange about the woman. And her name is Clea Lake. Uh, the Sorcerer Supreme, I guess he, don't, I don't know if he ever gets called the Sorcerer Supreme. The Sorcerer think, tells yeah. Dr. Strange that he and Clea have a psychic bond and uh, they uh, like shake hands and their hands glow with mystery. And Dr. Strange starts to unravel the mystery of what is happening in this movie. <laughs> um, the doctor goes to check on Clea, who is fine, but then she isn't fine. And then another five minutes just rolls by where absolutely nothing occurs. Uh, Finally, Morgan is stalking Dr. Strange and attempts to kill him through like bad luck and circumstances and a bus. Maybe it's all very questionable. Dr. Strange finally makes his way to the Sanctum Sanctorum, which I don't even know if we ever know it's called that or if that's just something I have from my knowledge uh, and asks about the ring that his father left him that. 
I guess, means something. Uh, the sorcerer explains that his parents were also magicians and they died protecting him. And the ring is his inheritance along with his magic abilities. Uh, the sorcerer explains that Clea's spirit has been displaced into the astral plane um, and that only Stephen can bring her back due to her due to their psychic connection. And uh, the sorcerer then explains that it, a very convoluted path to retrieve her. Just a very convoluted path of things that has to happen. And we get a name drop of the astral plane. So I guess that's something yeah. to point a stick at. Uh, the doctor hopes in hops into a wormhole or something that looks like all of those really creative backgrounds from when you got school pictures as a kid. <laughs> the, the ones you had to pay extra for. Imagine all of those just at once. And that's what it looks like behind Dr. Strange. It's like a Lisa Frank um, uh, uh, yeah, binder. It's <laughs> trippy as hell. Uh, the doctor hops in this one. Horn, and this is when my daughter Joyce turned to me and literally said, bro, what is happening? She said, bro. I, she said, bro, <laughs> what is happening? I wrote it down. That's hilarious. Uh, Morgan is there in this other place. And then maybe a butterfly also. And then there's some red lights. And then a guy on a horse shows up. Uh, and the doctor faces off with the dark red eyed, like bodysuit guy. And he utters the magic words that the sorcerers told him. And the demon is dispersed. He grabs Clea and jumps back into that crazy portal to make their escape. Morgan talks to the Dark Lord and avoids the blame and says that she didn't kill Strange because she's a woman and she still craves a man's touch. <laughs> that was the worst part of the movie. Oh my God. I was like, man, they really decided to introduce mega sexism this late in the game. <laughs> um, the Dark Lord tells Morgan that he will trade souls of the Earth for her to have the Doctor. And Morgan accepts this deal. Uh, the doctor discharges Clea and then having saved her, walks her home and immediately asks her on a date, which feels incredibly questionable at best. But they cover it with a line of dialogue. So I guess it's OK. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, 10 the years doctor older. returns to the sanctum where the sorcerer, the sorcerer offers to take like take his spot as the sorcerer. And the doctor says, nah, I'm good. And says goodbye, and he's leaving. He's trying to remove the ring, but he can't get it off his finger. And then he finds a stray cat and immediately is like, ah, here, come into the house. And releases a stray cat into the Sanctum Santorum and then just leaves. Um, and it turns out the cat is Morgan. Ah, uh, She takes out Wong, and some crazy synth music starts to play. Oh, yeah. As we get to watch her do a five-minute slow walking tour through the Sanctum Santorum. <laughs> but good news, guys, it's in near darkness, so you can't see anything. <laughs> I wrote the word thrilling. <laughs> thrilling. <laughs> She blasts the Sorcerer Supreme with some like energy from her hands and calls a demon to come and take him. Meanwhile, Clea and Doctor Strange have a date and Morgan's stalking nearby and takes control of Clea once more, locking her in herself. Her and Strange grab hands and teleport to another dimension. Uh, Morgan helps experience the power that he could hold. Like she, she unlocks and gives him fancy a, a fancy wizard outfit. And he gets a costume change and she promises him power. Uh, but her kiss is cold, but he don't care. And he kisses her again until it's warm. <laughs> uh, he lays Morgana down by the fire and, <laughs> and she begins to seduce him or him, her. It's very unclear. Uh, really, she's trying to get him to take off his magic ring, but he won't and she won't. So they switch to a different sexy venue where the Sorcerer Supreme is hanging from chains in a dungeon. Um, and <laughs> Doctor Strange refuses to join her still. And she threatens then in a line that is clearly delivered sexually, basically to magic rape him. Mm -hmm. uh, so she says, uh, do as I say, or I'll take my pleasure from you in other ways. Ugh. And the way the line was written was clearly meant to be she was going to take pleasure out of torturing him, torturing him. But the way it was delivered was definitely sexual. Take it both um, ways. <laughs> yeah. Morgan blasts him with her hand lasers, but he absorbs them with his own hand lasers and then shoots 
her with hand lasers. Uh, we get some of the goofiest close-ups and zoom outs I have ever seen in rapid succession as Dr. Strange grabs a sorcerer and escapes. Morgan is punished by the Dark One as she is turned into an old crone and cast into the pit for her failure. Back at the Sanctum, as the sun draws closer, the sorcerer reveals that he wanted to get taken by Morgana all along, because only then would Strange, by his own free will, rescue him and take up the mantle of sorcerer. It makes perfect sense. Of course. Uh, Doctor Strange finally agrees, and the transference of power takes place, and Strange is now the new sorcerer. The old sorcerer doesn't die. He does pass out, though. But his training has just begun, and now he is... More than a man. And they stress this for some weird reason. Uh, he carries the old sleepy sorcerer to bed like a baby in his arms. <laughs> and then sometime later, Clea comes to find the doctor. And there's a news story of this new craze sweeping the nation that they see as they walk by a storefront window. It's Morgan Le Fay advertising the Le Fay method. Which is like if you put positivity into the world or some nonsense some kind of stuff. TED Talk crap. <laughs> uh, the doctor tries to pick up Clea again, asking her on another date. And then, and instead of ending on that note, the doctor then goes walking through a park, passes a street magician, and displays his newfound powers by turning some flowers into a bird. <laughs> And then in all capitals, I wrote, Dr. Strange. <laughs> he is strange. <laughs> so that is this thing that we agreed to watch. <laughs> wow. I didn't even know it existed uh, before we randomly found it in a search. <laughs> I had it somewhere in my memory banks that it existed, but I had no context to what it was. It was made in that time frame of like the Incredible Hulk TV show, the Captain America yeah. movie that did really badly. And there was even a Captain America like appeared on the Hulk TV show, I think, a couple times with a, car, with a little car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thor was there at one point. The Spider-Man series, too, was on there. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'd never seen this. You'd never seen this. Let's let's talk about some things we liked. Yeah. I mean, I like some things. The uh, the production design, like the the sanctum and like the, the, the agree, the big bad guy, whatever, in, in the hells, whatever. He looked really that was such a weird. He effect. looked rough. His mouth was just like opening with like one little stick. Like, you know, it's just really terrible. But like the costumes were cool that the uh, effects were, I thought, pretty good for a 1978 TV movie. It was pretty good. I don't know. What do you think about the effects and stuff? I mean, um, today's standards, it's not great, but I mean, even by those standards, like what effects like if you look at like the actual effects, it's like the big red rubber chicken thing, <laughs> that crazy laser Zeppelin show we had to watch to get between dimensions. You had the the costumes were pretty cool, like the demon costumes and like her Morgan's sexy outfits and stuff. <laughs> they were really they were really sexing her up. I'll agree. And I I loved the Doctor Strange outfit once he got into it. Finally, yeah. It just took so long to get him into that goddamn outfit. I think the problem was that I didn't know this going in until after I had watched the whole thing. Was mm -hmm. that this was a long movie pilot for a hopeful TV series, and so oh. it all kind of makes more sense now. I'm like, oh, that's why they're introducing all this stuff. It takes so long to get to like any of the good stuff and right. in costume because it was like, oh, this is going to be the series we're going to start, and then it didn't happen. <laughs> Because it got really bad um, ratings. So something I liked. Um, let's see. Uh, the music was loud sometimes. I put the stinky uh, ass uh, uh, synthesizer was pretty badass. <laughs> there was there was a lot. Of, once again, it was like you were in a laser Zeppelin show a few times. <laughs> um, I thought the actor who played Wong, yes, Clyde Cusat. Kusatsu, who you'll recognize from something, he's got a, an IMDb page a mile long, was was the best performance in the 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 whole thing. Yeah, he was very just like a normal dude in this movie, and he was serene, just, and mm -hmm. he had no magic real inclination, and delivered a few actual serious lines. Yeah, he was very um, like real. I thought uh, Anna Marie Martin, who played Clea Lake. 
did pretty darn well. I was seeing uh, Jessica Peter Walter Putin, from like Arrested Je- Development. Jessica Walter. Yeah. But she, the worst part was that she was great on her own. And then as soon as she got, all of her other scenes were with either the Red Rubber Chicken. <laughs> yeah. Or with Peter Hooten, and he was so bad that every scene they were in together, it was like she was playing off a wall. Yeah, I'll sneak in that part of the one I didn't like was that Peter Hooten, who has to carry this movie as Doctor Strange, he was so wooden and like just like all his lines like yeah. they were dubbed over afterwards. So it's like almost like oh, the ADR on this was extensive, and he, his seems extensive. like all of his lines were ADR. It seemed like it was I don't know. Um, he was just real no. Bad. I agree. I totally agree. Um, but otherwise, this movie is not very forgivable on many fronts. I think the plot was fine for probably a half hour TV show, maybe 45 minutes, but for well, an hour and a half movie, like you said, they made sure you saw how everyone got to where they're going by watching them walk to every destination. <laughs> like they had to pad out this running time or something. It was so slow. What? Well, I wasn't kidding when I said like, and then there was 10 minutes where nothing happened and mm-hmm. then something happened and there was five more minutes where nothing happened and then something happened and then there was five more minutes where nothing happened. Like, let's watch them drive to all the way to the destination. Like, let's watch the whole drive. <laughs> or like that long <laughs> shot where Jessica Walter was in the sanctum mm-hmm. and just walking the house in the dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are we watching For them? an extended period of time. Um... <laughs> But yeah, this is not very redeemable. And the worst part is, is that I think my brain is making this better than it was because of the now knowledge I have of Doctor Strange. Right. It's almost like watching a fan film of it or something. And the Sorcerer Supreme and like, but none of that was actually covered or given context here. So I think this movie is probably worse than even I'm (laughs) estimating it because my brain is filling in all these blanks. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. Um, um, but also the horrible yeah. line about they kind of ruined Morgan's whole character by making say she couldn't kill Doctor Strange because I'm a woman she, too she's and still I still a woman <laughs> and oh my god what what uh, a stupid angle to take oh seven just so stupid <laughs> um all right now the things we didn't like uh <laughs> that was still that was, yeah, that was a lot of the things I didn't like already <laughs> uh guys this one's pretty bad you could probably skip this one like <laughs> like we watched it for you so you don't have to i watched this in three parts 30 minute chunks uh because i couldn't do it all in one sitting it was one of those because it's just so slow but like I, I like some of the good some of the parts of it it's just that i wish it was cut down to like 45 minutes it could have been half as long Poof, it was it was a lot yeah this was a this was a two sitting two sitter okay. yeah yeah, two sitter. <laughs> Didn't quite get up to three sitter. What well, was that? Got... What was the one three sitter we that I watched? Nutcracker. Yeah, Nutcracker. That was a three sitter. <laughs> well, some trivia for this movie. Uh, we got some interesting stuff. In a 1985 interview, Stan Lee cited this movie as the Marvel television project of the 1970s that he wound up giving the most input, and noting he became very friendly with the writer, executive producer, and director Philip DeGruyere Jr. Uh, Lee added that next to The Incredible Hulk, this was the live action adaptation of a Marvel character with which he was most pleased at the time. Lee was disappointed by the movie's low ratings, which he attributed to being aired against Roots. So this came on around the same exact time that Roots came on. So people were definitely watching that instead. Uh, Morgan Le Fay was the first Marvel foe to be adapted to live action. Uh, She later joined the Kingpin in the trial of The Incredible Hulk in 1989 and then the Red Skull in Captain America in 1990. Um, but they had Incredible Hulk was always on, but never had any Marvel villains. And it just had like, you know, standard bad guys kind of thing. Yeah. Um, in 1986, writer Bob Gale of Back to the Future fame was hired to write a theatrical Doctor Strange movie to be directed by Wes Craven for New World Pictures. So we could what? have had, hold on. A lot of words just happened there. So in 1986, for Wes Craven, Wes Craven was going to direct a Doctor Strange movie written by the guy who wrote Back to the Future. <laughs> That would have been crazy. So <laughs> the tones, the two mismatched tones yeah. there. I don't know what that would have created. Oh, my gosh. But budgetary reasons and unfamiliarity to comic book readers at the time, the film was canceled. Never went through. But I would have watched the hell out of that. Whatever the hell that would have been. 
Uh, this was a Marvel Comics TV pilot. Uh, it was one of several attempts in adapting a superhero over the small screen. Ultimately, no TV show resulted from the script. Um, although not named, the creature that Morgan Le Fay, the chicken monster, was she was talking to, uh, was visually mm. inspired by Doctor Strange's comic book arch nemesis Dormammu. So it was supposed to be Dormammu, but they're like that name's too weird. So I don't think she called him anything. My Dark Lord, my Master, or whatever. Um, yeah, that sounds right. And while Morgan could be seen as being inspired by Dormammu's sister and Strange's foe, Umar, uh, because apparently Morgan didn't appear in a comic book until like a month before this movie came out. So she technically was the first Marvel villain to be sprayed in live action. Um, okay. But, but then she became a regular character later on throughout um, Doctor Strange and stuff. She's a magical character. Um, but kind of more inspired by this movie, if anything, because uh, she's only like one, one comic book appearance before this movie. So, Steve, I hear you got a bit for us. Boy, howdy, do I. Well, this was a, you know, the Doctor Strange we know and love is a remake of this. And we didn't even know this existed or only kind of knew we existed. Mm -hmm. So I've got a game that I call remake it or fake it, where I'm going to give you 10 movies and you have to tell me if they are remakes Mm -hmm. or if I'm faking it and they're, they're originals. I might know some of these, maybe some of these you might, but some of these you probably will not. (laughs) All right. Are you ready to go? Let's do it. Remake it or fake it. Uh, White Christmas. Uh, yes, I believe that is a remake. No. Oh, you meant, oh, I thought you meant like a new White Christmas. <laughs> so there's only the one old one. <laughs> yes, just the one old one. Gotcha. <laughs> so not, not a great start, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right. Dark Man. Um, maybe it's like a, an old twenties movie. So I'll say yes. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. <laughs> it was based off a comic. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that makes more sense. All right. I am Sam. Ooh. I would hope not. But since the last two weren't, I'm going to go with yes. No, I'm sorry. That's not it. <laughs> it's just we all know. <laughs> just a fall of a, none of a remakes. All right. Ben Hur. I think I remember from film school before there was the Charlton Heston, there was a silent film version. So I'm going to say yes. That's correct. Okay. At least uh, I knew that. The one. Charlton Heston one is the 1959. It was a remake of a 1925 black and white film. Yes. Uh, and crazy factoid, the 1959 version features 365 speaking parts. Whoa. And it's actually been remade twice. They did it again in 2016. Oof. I don't even remember that. That's right. No one does. <laughs> so good work on that one. Good work. All right. Father of the Bride. That was a French film with um, Depardieu first, I believe. So, yes. All right, so yes, you're right. Know about the that. Oh, one, really? Though. Okay, never mind. It's a remake of a 1951 film of the same name uh, about a daughter getting married. In that that movie, though, the daughter was being played by a young Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So you got it right, but not for the right reason. <laughs> I shouldn't add more to the answer. It still counts. All right. Dinner for schmucks. Oh, I hope not. I'm going to say no. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. <laughs> uh, it's a remake of a 2010. Uh, the 2010 movie is a remake of a 1998 French film. Oh, no. It's called French La Dine de Con, which translates to The Dinner Game. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. All right. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I mean, you're probably going to get me on some technicality like it was a short film or something, but I'm going to say no, I don't think so. No, it was not. You got that right. Yeah. You nailed it. <laughs> All right. Grown ups. Mm. It's just so generic. I'd say there's no reason that should be a remake. So I'll say no. That's right. Whew. It's not. <laughs> you did it. We're all proud of you. You should be. 
Uh, hold on. I'm trying to put all your, your missed points in here. It's just getting overwhelming. <laughs> There's so many of them. At this point, I mean, <laughs> maybe. All right. The Fly. Yes, that was a much older film with Vincent Price. That's correct. The 1986 film was a remake of a 1958 classic. Yeah. All right. This is the last one. Vanilla Sky. Hmm. That's like the weird Tom Cruise movie with the it raining is frogs. The weird Tom Cruise movie. I think that was an original writing thing. So I'm saying no. Sorry, that's incorrect. The 2001 movie is a remake of a Spanish film, Abre, Abre Los Hoyos, or Open Your Eyes. But get this, Penelope Cruz played the same role in both versions. Oh, okay. All right. Good that's for right. her. All right. So with that, German, you got one, two, three, four, five correct. Half in remake it or fake it <laughs> as we take time to remember remakes that no one really needs to remember and in school 50 percent means you fail <laughs> that's right you you still fail yes <laughs> you will be having a letter sent home young man that's understandable <laughs> an actual letter that you're going to write you know paper yeah <laughs> but that brings us to some radical recommends if you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. What do you recommend I do? I recommend Pleasant. All right. So last night, I actually got the chance to see Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, mm -hmm. a friend of ours, uh, was is a very big Beetlejuice fan. So she actually rented out a theater for all of her friends to go see it, like a private screening. We all paid a movie ticket price, but just to her because she bought it at the theater. So it was pretty fun. Everyone went in costumes and stuff. We didn't have Beetlejuice oh, costumes. Cool. So we just wore all black because we we're also tired from Dragon Con. So we didn't have a lot of effort to put into Fair. it. But uh, I wasn't expecting much at all because... Frankly, a lot of the Tim Burton stuff lately, I don't like very much. So I was expecting to be disappointed because I, I really like the first one. I'm not a huge Beetlejuice fan, but I was pleasantly surprised. I laughed a lot. I think it was a lot funnier than the first Beetlejuice. And even the first Beetlejuice okay. is pretty funny. Um, but this one was more like I mean, it's certainly a classic. Yeah, absolutely. And this one didn't disappoint. And it kind of gives us an origin story of sorts for Beetlejuice, which the first okay. one didn't do, um, which I won't spoil or anything. But um it's just it was a little overcrowded with plot lines. Um, they could have cut like one or two of them out. And the movie would have been fine. But I'm pleasantly surprised because I was expecting not to like it at all. And it was actually really fun and silly as opposed to the Tim Burton plotting overly stylized stuff like this is uh, Willy Wonka remake and stuff, which I just. just hey, re remember when we all thought that was charming? For a couple movies <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> and then it wore real thin because it's the same thing in every movie. And he put his wife in every film, and yeah. And did, wait, did Danny Elfman do the music for this movie? He did, and that was okay. So in that case, it at least sounded the same. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> 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 but Jenny Ortega, uh, she, I think Jenny, right? That's her name. I think it's Jenny. Uh, Jenna, Jenna, right? Yeah, Jenna Ortega. You're right. There we go. Nailed she it. was perfectly, perfectly good in that role. She fits really well as uh, Lydia Dietz's daughter. Um, and you, you'll see in the trailer also that you know Catherine O'Hara is back as the stepmom um, who she played in the first. Oh movie. yeah. And uh, the the father, of course, is uh, the actor who played him is dead. He was the principal, I think, in Ferris Bueller and the dad in this in the first movie. Um, but he also was arrested on like child pornography charges. Yeah. So they they, like they deal with that in a sort of fun way actually in this movie. So that's actually I appreciated as well. Um, oh, good. But yeah, and Maka Bellucci's gorgeous. One of the highlights of this was uh um what's his face Green Goblin guy um. Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. He has a really funny part in this movie. Um, totally unnecessary for the plot, but he's he's hilarious. But um, totally worth it. Totally worth it for him. So not my favorite movie in the world, but pleasantly surprised. I think older kids would enjoy it too. It's probably a little too much for younger kids, but um, it's it's it was a lot of fun. So yeah, maybe check it out sometime. Yeah, as far as remakes go, I mean, it's not that bad. It's kind of the best, like reboots. Like you can't, yeah, you can only hope for so sequels much. After or 20 sequels years, thirty yeah. years after the fact. Yeah, you can. Only you can tell Michael Keaton's voice is a little gone, and it changed quite a bit, but his energy is still totally there. Like he rocks oh, it good. with the energy, so it's good. 
well, he's been waiting for this. And like in the last two years, he's gotten to play Batman again. He gets to play Beetlejuice oh, again. Yeah. Like he's just rocking the hits. <laughs> this is like what Harrison Ford did, but this, I don't hate this. <laughs> Where he's like, I'm going to be Indiana Jones one more time. There's another, another paycheck in this, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to play on solo, but you got to kill me this time. You might need to give me some amphetamines to get me on set. I'm, uh, I'm going to. I'm going to take one of my small propeller planes home. <laughs> <laughs> Probably crash it again like I've done a few times. Don't uh, worry, I'll just uh, park it on the freeway. I'll use the force <laughs> to put it there. <laughs> <laughs> but that brings us to some trailer reviews. Yay! <laughs> nope. <laughs> I feel like that's happened the last two or three times. It's because they both start with a T and they're on the board. I can't see it that far uh, away. Okay. It says thank you. And then it says trailer. And then I push the wrong button every time. <laughs> well, no one ever leaves us any comments or anything. So we could probably just take, we could just delete that one for the board. We probably, probably. can. <laughs> probably. Uh, well, this week I chose Sonic the Hedgehog 3, um, which looks v- at least tonally different from the first two in the series. With, I'm sure, a lot of comedy uh, to back us up. And you have Idris Elba as Knuckles, the straight man. Um, what have you thought about these movies so far? And what's your what's your take on this one, Jeremy? Well, I've only seen the first one. Um, I really I thought it was cute. I really enjoyed it because I was a Sonic fan growing up. Um, and I think Jim Carrey really fits well into that universe. You know, it was a good casting choice. Um, it could have been like Jack Black, I guess, for Robotnik as well. But I think because he'd be a bigger dude, you know, but Jim Carrey does a great right. job. But I didn't see a second one. But I, that's the first thing I thought, like what you said, was the tone felt <laughs> much more intense and serious. In this yeah, one. action movie-ish. Yeah, it'd be like yelling out for Sonic, don't die, and things like that. And then you have Keanu Reeves coming in as Shadow as the new villain. Um, and I think he's his voice is so recognizable. Yeah, the fact that you have Keanu Reeves is just like John Wick intensity. Yeah. In a, in a Sonic, Sonic movie. Sonic movie. <laughs> so, I mean, I think this looks perfectly suited. If I was like 10, 11 years old and it's coming out, I'd be like, Mom, I got to see this. This looks cool as hell. Um, when you got to figure, they also, they found there's this huge fan base with like 8 to 12 year olds who right. are now 16 to 18 year olds. So it probably makes sense that they're they're totally shifting up. I wrote the same thing. Like they're aging with their audience, the new audience of Sonic viewers. Like it's so smart. It's like what they did with Harry Potter, where like the third they got more serious and more intense, more adult themes as they got older. Um, same thing they're doing with Sonic, I guess. Which is I smart. mean that just means that by the time we get to Sonic Seven, it'll be like Saving Private Ryan, <laughs> and Sonic Eight will just flat out be pornography. <laughs> And Sonic 25 will be just at the the retirement community. <laughs> It'll be a noir film. <laughs> I'm a grizzled Sonic uh, now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm mildly, like, I've enjoyed the other two in that there's something I could watch with my kids and have watched with my kids. And I love Ben Schwartz, the guy doing the voice oh, he's of, great. of Sonic. He's just great. It's just John Ralphio come to life. <laughs> yep. um, but I don't know. I, I kind of hope this is it. They don't they need, need to give this. this. They don't need a four. I think we're out of main Sonic villains anyway. Oh, they'll make them up. There were a lot of games. That's true. This will be like Dark Tales or some crap. It won't even matter. Dark Tales. Ooh. Woo. <laughs> um, all right. So this one I give um, Gary Busey is like on, sitting crisscross applesauce on the carpet watching the TV too close and Sonic's on TBS. And he's really excited. And he goes, I got something like that. And he goes to his room and he gets out a big bag of marbles <laughs> that he kind of forgot he had. And we're all sitting reading his paper. He says, don't make a mess, scary. And Gary's like, I won't, I won't. And so he starts setting up like this elaborate runway and he gets a blue marble out. He's like, this one's Sonic. And Ryle's like, whatever. <laughs> Just don't make a mess. <laughs> And Gary like rolls it down a thing that rolls down a couch, rolls down a magazine. He set up like a Rube's Goldberg and he's real excited. And then we cut to like a montage style scene where Gary Busey is setting up more and more elaborate <laughs> contraptions he's a to genius. roll marbles down. <laughs> and there he's making the sonic noise as they're rolling down. And 
And we all sit in this montage. We get like Raul stumbling over one, walking through a door. And then he Raul goes to pour out his morning like cereal. And there's a marble in there. Like that classic 80s trope kind of crap. It's got a Danny Elfman soundtrack to it. And then finally, they <laughs> cut to, to Gary Busey, who's taken over the entire living room with tubes and shit hanging. And it's just everywhere. And, and Raul goes, Gary, we really have to talk about your mo- uh, about your new hobby. And and Gary looks at me and goes, oh, why roll it, Raul? Is it like a, is it driving you marbles? <laughs> and Raul goes, did you do this whole setup just to land that punchline? <laughs> Have and you Gary lost your marbles, goes, Raul? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> God damn it, Raul. God, Gary. And Raul storms to his room and shuts the door where you hear him slip on a marble, but you don't get to see it. I'm thinking all in 80s tropes here. I love it. All to Danny Elfman. I would give this one. Uh, so Gary Busey convinces Raul to like agree to a three day birthday party. So <laughs> he's like, Raul, this is love. Next year, I, I want a already. birthday party in the last three years. Like, all right, all right, Gary, I'll agree to that if you behave for the next year. Next year, we'll do the three day birthday party. Like, okay, I'll, I'll behave. So, a whole year, Gary is really, really a good guy, good roommate, doing his best. He messes up sometimes, but he's doing his best. And Raul notices this. So he's like, all right, here's your third day, three day birthday party. He's like, I want to see Sonic. So they go to see Sonic in theaters. And he mm-hmm. says, okay. The rest of the birthday party is all cocaine. <laughs> he's like, what? He's like, well, if we want to be like Sonic the Hedgehog, we got to take lots of cocaine. He's like, all right. So they're just doing uppers and going fucking crazy. <laughs> so the first day they do some cocaine. It's fun. They're doing a lot of shit. They want to start a band. They want to start a business. The next day is kind of rough because they wake up with a big hangover, but they're like, okay. Oh, so Raul, Raul goes along with this because oh, it's Gary's birthday. He agreed. He agreed. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Okay. Go on. So the next day they do it again. And like, oh, this gets, it's a little fun, but somehow it's a little more clouded than last time. We're going to keep doing it. more cocaine ah, amphetamines. All right, Gary, let's do it. And the third day, it's even worse hangover, but they just get more intense and they do some coke and they realize they're not as up as they used to be. And they're more intense and serious. And it's all reflecting the journey that these Sonic movies have taken. You know, it's gotten more from fun and ridiculous. First day of cocaine. Second, things are a little more complicated. Third day, things third one just gets serious. dark. It's dark. <laughs> It's a journey. <laughs> and, and that's the when end, we they, cut to the third roommate. It's been there the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. It's just sad, sad Keanu. It's just sad Keanu. Keanu. <laughs> I've always lived here, man. <laughs> I've just been sitting quietly. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but that takes us I come to back end. from my gun range training and just tuck in for the night. And my Hawaiian food, man. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> But that brings us to the end of the episode 205, I believe. And so for next time, I believe we're going to have some crazy nerd world of... Well, I don't know, we might not have anything, so I'm not say that yet. What am I going to say? You got it, baby. Yeah, I'm gonna say, oh, we it. are do that. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, for next episode, episode 206, we have some crazy nerd wheel of fortune for you. So who knows what we'll be talking about? That's right. AI will decide. And That's then right. the random number generator will... We'll kick our ass. <laughs> All that and more next time. Come on back and be our nerdy audience. We will keep on coming back and being your nerdy co-hosts. Thanks again, Internet. Stay nerdy, my friends. Thanks for listening to A Play on Nerds. Feel free to email feedback at aplayonnerds.com with all your questions or comments. Shoot us a message on Facebook or Twitter and earn yourself a sweet shout out on the show. Review us on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts so even more nerds can find us. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, we aren't picky. Check out our entire back catalog and other offerings at aplayonnerds.com. And how? How?